tonight. My name is Carl Erickson. I'm the president of Economic Object and also Mexico West Michigan. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank our sponsors, as always, before we get going. Priority Health, uh, X-Ray, Economic Object, and Bird Quarter Machinery make it possible for us to have snacks and bring interesting people in from far away to uh, talk. So thank you to them. Uh, if you aren't on our mailing list, the way to get on our mailing list is to visit xpwestmichigan.org and sign up for your account. And all you really get is meeting reminders, essentially. Sometimes a little extra email, but not much, I promise. And if you're so inclined, you can have your own little personal blog and do all sorts of self expressive things. Um, so the best way to do that is just to visit the site. Uh, let's see here. This is the mystery of the night. Why does Ron Jeffries' um, license plate have these letters on it? But you ponder that. You know, we're going to write your answers on the car. Write your answers in the car, yeah. <laughs> um, Ron Jeffries and Chet Hendrickson are here tonight. They are independent consultants. They've been doing uh, TDD training and agile process development and adoption kinds of things. They do it all over the world. They are not respected in Michigan for some odd reason. So if your company is looking for consultants to help you get an agile process going, I highly recommend them. I think they are very effective in what they do, and they're close by, relatively speaking. Uh, Ron has been, well, let me take a little poll here. How many people present tonight were born after 1961? Okay, so Ron's been programming for longer than most of us have been alive. Which we owe him some respect. That's right? even depressing when I do it. It's worse when you do it. <laughs> <laughs> He's not just this old drunk guy who hauled in off the street to talk to you tonight. He's been doing this a long time. He knows something about this. In fact, he was one of the original authors of the Agile Manifesto. Uh, he was the first XP coach, by virtue of being an XP coach and the first XP, uh, XP coach and the first XP project, the CQ project at Chrysler. So I, I guess that's a for a lot of good questions later, potentially, in the history of XP. He's written a book on TDD and C Sharp. Uh, lots of papers. Xprogramming.com is a widely ripped off website. We had one of his images upstairs, and I used them in talks I did it myself. Um, oh, no, no. We're going to be in a very strict time schedule tonight. Uh, we're going to take a break whenever he's done talking. And uh, then we'll flip into, after snacks, we'll flip into question mode. So I hope you all brought your tantalizing agile adoption questions or your questions or your meaning of the world questions because Ron has promised me you can answer them all. So I will talk about the April meeting when I close the meeting with Dave Bob. With no further ado, Ron. I believe, as I mentioned at dinner, that one of the legal answers to a question is I don't know. So I will answer all questions. Necessary in that way. What I kind of wanted to do tonight was to talk to you about the stuff that's on my mind, such as it is. Um, the uh, oh, there's some over here. The uh, topic that Carl kind of pointed to uh, was one of the recent articles on my website, um, talking about. Making the software get done. What's the name of that article? I don't remember. Making the date? Making the date, yeah, that's the same. Um, and that's part of a theme of thinking and writing that I've been trying to do for a while to figure out what's going on. And, and that article makes the point that, of course, they ask you for more than you can possibly do in a date sooner than you can possibly do it by because that is their job. And the reason that that's the case looks kind of like this. We know that a product, in order to be successful, needs to be kind of a clean combination of features and capabilities, um, all nicely arranged and put away in some sensible way. And the closer to looking like a neat little box the product is, the better you'll probably do. However, when you think of a product, you can't think of it that way. There's things that you think would be really cool that are bigger than that. And there's things you totally forget. 
And there's other things that are big, and other things that are little. Um, it doesn't usually look like anything else. The, so, <coughs> when people who are devising a product try and figure out what the product ought to be, whether that's an in-house product or a product for sale, they, in order to be sure that they've got everything important, they kind of blow this thing out until they're sure that they've got everything that could possibly matter in there. Now the other thing that is true, and uh, we may go down this path or we may not to, to look at some detail on this, but the other thing that's true is, the sooner you get your product, the better. But, um, if, if you could deliver it today, you'd rather have it today than at some future date, because you can start getting whatever benefit that thing can give you. So the result of that is that Every project begins with a picture that looks like this. Some kind of features this way, and there's some kind of time this way. And they, you know, those they people have in mind that you'll have all these features by this day. And the day will be made up almost always. I, I once worked on a project where the day was actually incredible. It was a tax preparation package. It turns out tax preparers choose a package they're going to use in December. So if your product isn't there with the features, they're not going to choose it. And so we actually had a, what I considered a fairly credible deadline, but in many, many years of doing something well, that might be the only deadline I've ever seen that I actually believe was credible. There are a few others if you're shipping uh, a new automobile, you sort of need the software here with it and stuff like that. But mostly deadlines are made up. And therefore, they have chosen some arbitrary amount of stuff to be done by some arbitrary date. And that is okay because that is their job. They need to decide how much we need and what day we need to buy. The only problem, of course, is we probably can't do that. Now, the theoretical, old-fashioned way of doing this, and nobody does this anymore, but I'll draw a picture anyway. The old-fashioned way of doing this kind of work was that we would get requirements nailed down, we would get the design nailed down, we would do the coding nailed down, and we would do the testing, and that kind of thing. And so, the thinking was that you would do all this prep work, and then at some stage, two thirds or three quarters of the way through the project, you would start doing visible work that people could recognize as leading to the project uh, results. And there would be this sudden surge of stuff coming out, which would deliver all the stuff you wanted on the day that you wanted. To my knowledge, that trick never works. Um, what happens is that this takes too long to get started, and then when we actually get started working, curve isn't as nearly vertical as we thought it would be. Um, so, if you think of this uh, in, a, in a techie kind of a way, this is a problem because all of this money and time is being spent and no one knows whether or not the project is on track. Now, knowing if the project is on track is very important. In this tax product I made, this was long before Agile and XP existed. Not as long as it might have been, actually. Um, right before. The fact was the product was not going to be on time. I know that now because it wasn't on time. Now, my colleague Charles Baer, who, who was building the tax form software that we were putting the things up on the screen and putting numbers in and calculating, had a list of all the forms that had to be done in the entire plan of the company, and he had lines drawn through them saying, we can do these and we probably aren't going to be able to do those. My team was doing the software, which was like operating systems, you know, like writing a, a bizarre spreadsheet program behind the, behind the curtains. And they kept asking us for better changes to the human factors and make the engine faster and make it smaller, longer, faster, you know, more continuous, whatever they wanted. And features that we had to do to support the tax forms because Although most tax calculations are pretty simple, some are not, some are iterative, and there's, I can tell, the cursive. 
So it was kind of a kind of a problem. And we could not show that we weren't going to do it. So we were in that mode that you get into where you know you're doomed, but you can't convince them that they're giving you too much to do, so you just kill yourself. Hoping that you'll die before they discover that it's not going to work. So the result of, of what happened was that come December, this product was not ready. And therefore, did not sell any copies into the tax marketplace. And the result of that was that my buddy who owned this company lost about $2 million of his own money in advertising and other things, which he could have either deferred if he had decided to go forward for next year, or could have just not spent it all if he had decided to cancel the project. So there's one man in Ann Arbor who's not usually happy to see me on the street when he sees me because he believes that I cost him $2 million. Now, I had help, but he, he believes that. Now, the problem is that software projects, from a technical viewpoint, have no API. They have no interface that you can do anything with. They do not give off any information other than the cries and anguish of the programmers and people working on them. And there's no control that you can put into them other than to say, work harder, work smarter. And so what that does is it means that the relationship between the classical standard software development and the people who buy it is they don't have any way of knowing what you're doing or <coughs> making you go faster, better, or anything. They just don't have controls over the project. That makes them weird. Because you don't like to spend millions of dollars and have no idea almost literally, whether it's going to be working or not. And so I believe that the Agile projects, the Agile methods, have fundamentally been created to address that problem. And the theory of an Agile project is, don't do it like this, Instead, build features a few at a time, starting from the very beginning. Have those features really work, have them run, have them tested, have them all be as good as they can possibly be. And if you do that, the idea is you'll be able to tell how you're doing. Because the one thing we can be certain of is this line doesn't point at that star. Because they've asked for too much to soon. So the line is going to point out like this. Too little, too late. <clears throat> I'm sorry. That's reality. Your project will deliver too little, too late. But it's not our problem because they ask for too much too soon. So there's some range of what's possible in here, and it's all kind of below this line of what's going on. So the Agile projects provide information to management that says, okay, look, they're going this fast. What should we do? If I could have drawn this line for Don, he would have known either to expect to spend more money or to delay his spending or to cancel the project. And any one of those things would have been better for him. <coughs> than it would have been than what happened was. So now, if management had this information, they could do a better job of managing. And then we just have this minor problem of can we write projects that will emit this kind of information. What could management do? Well, it turns out that they have control actions that kind of are delimited by this space. They could say, we use the line. They could say, well, let's ship it here. The date's important. December is important. Let's cancel the West Coast tax program and, and sell it only on the East Coast and ship it in December. They could make that decision. They could make a decision to ship it anywhere along this line, including the possibility of let's ship it with everything on whatever date the data says it will come.
for myself. The, if we had this information, management could take control actions. And there are fundamentally three control actions, and only three, that make sense for most projects. They could reduce scope. That means ask us for less. They could extend the schedule. Or what's the third option? They, they could help. <laughs> now, occasionally, occasionally, they actually can help. They could. Um, remove other projects from our plate. They could maybe give us resources that would help us, although usually adding resources to a late project makes it later, but, but if it was way down in here when they saw that something needed to be done, maybe they could actually add some resources. Um, it's always good to have faster, better computers. That always is a good story. Uh, so there's some slim chance that they could really help. I think it's a, a rare uh, occurrence that they can help, but it's, uh, it's possible. Usually, at least in this country, usually hitting the date is more important than hitting the functionality because they remember the date and almost no one really knows what the functionality is. So I would normally recommend that, a, that somebody who is guiding a project work to hit the date because that will be remembered, and deal with the functionality uh, shortfall, if any, later. Um, what we need to talk about, though, is what, could, what do we have to do, what does an Agile project, what does any project have to do in order to make this curve work, to make it possible? Well, do I want to be real consistent with color? I guess I do, as long as I can do it before I forget. So I think that what... I'm not sure why I have to draw this additional picture because it's going to look just like the one we had, um, except it now, now is an entirely different topic, uh, which is to zero in on what's going on on this line. This is the thing that lately I've been calling running tested features. And all of those words are important. For this reason, I'm working with a client right now who needed to do some application, some amazing new rewrite of something. They needed to add one byte to a record or something. And they've been working on it for a year. And they've been working on it in an, in an agile fashion um, in the sense that they're working iteratively. But they have deployed none of it. So now they are a year down the road having deployed none of their software, and in a very important sense because of the way they work and, and the testing they do and don't do, they don't really know whether this will work. They don't really know when they deploy it, will the server farm continue to serve or will it just do evil stuff? They, because they just have no way to know. So the problem is that this picture, though they have things coming out, and these aren't very much like features, but it's a very systems -y project, and I might cut them some slack on that. They don't know whether this thing is really ready to go or not. And the reason can be drawn on the chart pretty simply. They are putting in an unknown number of defects. Defects are basically, if you think about it, negative features. Really, that's true. So they're putting in some number of defects as they go. But I don't know whether it's this many defects or that many defects or this many <laughs> defects, whether nothing works. So there's this huge, vague blob of defects coming along in this software as they work, which means that the actual height of this curve might be here or here or here, it could even be that everything they've coded up for the last year works. How many would bet that everything they've coded up for the last year in C++ works? 
Um, I was hoping I could make a few bucks, but apparently nobody, wa nobody wants to take me on. So, so these things that we're building, these little features that we're building, have to really work and they have to really be tested. It is also important that they be features because if we say, okay, we're reorganizing the database and we're, we're restructuring the Framus and stuff like that, the people who pay for this project don't understand what that means. So it's better if the features look like things that some human could understand because most of the people who have the money in this world are humans, not technical people. Most of us technical people don't have any money to dish out and they, we have to rely on people who actually think in terms of stuff that, that is in the real world and not so much in, stuff, in terms of the f classes and objects and whatever we think of. So we need to be able to speak in the terms that they can understand and features that they could actually grok is a better idea than saying that we've um, you know, optimized these whatnot deals. So what happens on this project is that if we're shooting for mm, this date, somewhere in here, we have to start testing and fixing these bugs. And I don't know why this is true here in the 21st century, but almost every project I visit tests their software by coding it up and then running it a little bit and tweaking it or maybe stepping through it in the debugger which is great for today if you step through all the right stuff and if your eyes see what needs to be seen. But tomorrow when you change that software, you're not gonna step through every darn line of the software every day. And so some of the tests you did yesterday will not be done today, and therefore there will be big holes in the software that bugs can fly through. So what happens if you're working that way is you have to put a block of time in here for testing and fixing and you have no idea how long it's gonna take. Now, if you have a testing department, at the beginning of the project, you will say, this is a year-long project, the testing department will say, cool, we want two months to test it, or three, whatever, the, whatever their magic number is. As you get closer and closer to the deadline, your software will, of course, not have all the features that you thought you were supposed to have because this line is lower than that line, and will always be, because this is the line, the first date and quantity of features that you made it clear you wouldn't kill yourself if they asked for it. So you know it's a maximum possible performance. So you know you're gonna be less than that. So you're late, and so you're pushing out into this interval where the testing people said they wanted two or three months, whatever they wanted to, to test it. So what do you do? Well, you put pressure on the testing people, and you tell them, you must test it in uh, six weeks. You must test it in a month. Um, we're way past the ship date, you have to test it tomorrow and then testing people will just go crazier and crazier because they know that they cannot do that. And they also know a thing that I, uh, my colleague George Cameron in Omaha said during one of the projects that he was, uh, that I was helping him with there. He said, isn't testing quality into a project a lot like spinning straw into gold? You know, nobody knows how to do that. You can't test quality in. It's, if it wasn't in, it's gonna be mostly too late and all you're gonna do is fix the worst of these bugs and make the make the system keep going, or you hope make the system keep going. So we have to do better than that. And what we do that is gonna be better than that, of course, is these features have to really be features, they have to really be running, and they have to really be tested. So let me, let me talk a little bit about what that means and, and, and kind of how you get there. I guess I'll draw my testing picture now. That was gonna be later, but I think I'll draw it now. Um, here we have some chunk of software. Let's see, if this was a chalkboard, that would have been really great, but it's not so good with the squeakers here. It's not so terrible. So, we all know that, that defects occur in software, not because programmers put them in, but because they are bugs and they come in from the outside, there's some source of bugs in the world and they, they creep into your program when you least expect it. So, and in a way, it is like that. Although, in fact, I believe, in fact, we put them all in ourselves. In a way, it's like that because you wouldn't put it in if you thought of it and so it is as if it came out of the blue because it was something you weren't thinking about. So, out here in the world are these little bugs 
to be represented by these little winged creature here that are kind of flying in to get into the product. And we need to do something to keep them out because if the features aren't tested, we may not assume that they work and we will not know how much we've got done and our managers won't know how much they've got done and they will either be unhappy now or they will be unhappy later, but someday they will be unhappy and when your manager is unhappy, unhappy runs downhill. I believe you've heard that saying in slightly different phrasing before. Unhappy runs downhill and you will be unhappy. So you have to have something and today, Chad and I, while we were sitting over at uh, the Barnes & Noble, decided that what you need is a bug zapper. Zap. That when the bugs come flying in, the bug zappers zap them. And there's kind of two levels of that. And the, the, the bug zapper could be thought of as a, a test that the customer defined, if not wrote, that said, if the software does this, it's doing what I want. And if it doesn't, it isn't. Now, if we had a test like that, and if it was automated, then every time we thought we were done with some feature, we would run the automated test, and it would say yes or no. If it said no, we would keep working. If it said yes, we would stop working on that and work on something else. Now, the other thing that we want, because a, a test like that is often pretty hard to, uh, pretty hard to, to debug, if you will, um, if, if you have a, if you have a, a, a acceptance test level test, a high level test, on the product, and it doesn't work, there could be a lot of causes to that. And so programmers today, as you guys know, because you've had, you've had talks about this and even once upon a time an old demo of it back in 2004, you also want a layer of like screens, you know, as those porch screen things, that if the bugs get past the zapper, they will still not get into the software, which is the unit test, the test-driven development test that the programmers might write. I think you need a couple of layers of this because if you only have your programmer tests, you have no real assurance that the system is doing what the customer wants. The customer will not have confidence in the product and will therefore demand that you do things. And none of them will be good. They will demand that you explain it. They will demand that you document it. They will demand that you do a bunch of stuff that doesn't address their real need, which is to have a measure of how fast are we going. So, the automated customer test. How many teams in this room are doing something like an agile process right now? How many of you have automated customer tests? Hands all over the room drop, a few stay up. Automated customer tests are the most not done pro uh, practice in all of agile software development, near as I can tell. Pair programming might be uh, not done, but most teams pair at least a little bit like when things are really tough. And they are very important because they are part of the feedback loop between the customer and the developer. And if the customer is not happy, happiness runs downhill. So one of the things that we do in order to make this chart work, put the chart back up just to, over here as a reminder of what it looks like. There it is. Um, one of the things we do is that we do testing. Testing is really cool because if you're going to develop your software incrementally, you're going to be changing everything incrementally. And if you're changing everything here mentally, you're going to be breaking stuff in the past. And the sooner the tests tell you that, the better it is. It is better to find out 10 minutes or an hour after you code something that you've broken something than it is to find out a week later or two weeks later. There are teams practicing Scrum. Anybody here do Scrum? There are teams practicing Scrum in the world that will do a sprint. How long are your sprints? One month? Two weeks? Two months? A single sprint in two or three months? Yeah, how long is a sprint? Ah, three is better. Um, there are teams doing Scrum who will do a sprint of developing software and then do a sprint of seeing if it works. Which means if you're doing a one-month sprint that it's an average of six weeks between when you put a bug in and when you know it's there. In six weeks, most programmers have forgotten what they did because they're thinking about 10 or 15 or 20 other features between now and then. They have no idea what they did. And if I write... Uh, you know, that carpet there represents a computer program. If I write the whole thing and then I tell you that one of those squares has a problem in it, you're going to have trouble figuring out which square it is. Whereas if I drew each square one at a time and you looked at it, you would be able to figure out. So the longer we spread out the testing cycle, the worse it is with respect to actually 
finding out that we have a problem and fixing the bug. So we don't want to do that. We want to do things much closer in. And we're building all this software all the time. Now, there's other forces that come into play with respect to this running tested stuff. If we do a big feature, this is a big feature. Features are mostly rectangular because my cards have grids on them. Um, if we do a big feature, there will be mistakes in that feature. If we do a little feature, there'll be mistakes in that feature, right? Uh, you know, I might be able to write 10 lines of code without a bug in them. A bug consisting of at least a missing semicolon that won't compile, and I would guess I can't write 100 lines of code without a real bug in them. In fact, I wouldn't even begin to try and write 100 lines of code without a real bug in them. So there are problems with every big feature that we do. And there's two kinds of problems that, that, that I, that I kind of want to call out, um, although, of course, there's an infinite number of problems that can really occur. But you can think of them as um, these two things might be that we just had the wrong idea Oh, I forgot to run that little thing that says turn off your cell phone. Um, these things might have just been the wrong idea. We might have had a bad understanding of what we had to do or, or, or how we were going to do it. It just made no sense in the thing. And then we might have the wrong implementation, just an error in this deal. Because the code is big and the feature is big, although the errors are all tiny, and in there somewhere, some, you know, usually most errors are one line of code. Um, our search space is very big. We know it's over here, but we have to hunt around. So if we were to break this big feature down into lots of little features, thusly, I'm not quite sure why three is a good number, but it is. Um, if we break this feature down into lots of little things that we can pay attention to, and if we kind of choose them one at a time, here, do this part, then do this part, then do that part, then when those mistakes show up, same kind of mistakes, they're smaller, they're easier to find. So. One of the things that will help an Agile team go forward and, and be more successful, oddly enough, is just working on smaller features. This is challenging because customers, of course, say, this is useless to me unless you give me everything. That's kind of their first position on everything. And you want to go in and say, would it be sensible if it could only do this one little thing? Um, I was working with a team that had to do this thing where they wanted to collect a whole bunch of statistics on these servers. They fanned the job out to a bunch of servers. They wanted to collect a whole bunch of statistics on these servers, servers send them across some com, decom list, whatever, you know, communications path to the main machine and then print out a complicated report of all these statistics. And they said, well, obviously we can't reduce that story because it's, you know, that, that's what the customer wants. I suggested Calculating the following statistic, zero. Sending that one statistic across the comm line and creating a report that printed the statistic is zero, actually printing the zero that came across the thing. So it's kind of the world's smallest thing. Get any message to go across this deal, put a zero in it, display it. And they said, no, no one would ever settle for that. I turned to their customer and I said, would you understand that as progress on your application? And he said, yes. Which is much better than what they had told him, which was first we'd like to spend a week calculating the statistics, and then we'd like to spend a week sending things over the phone line, and then we'd like to spend a week formatting the report. At the end of which he would have had something he understood. So when we break these things down this way, we need, if we break them down in, in terms that customers can understand, they will be happier, and the problem will be smaller, and it will be good that the problem is smaller. Carl. I have a historical question for you. We've always used the phrase minimal working system to describe what we use to track. Uh-huh. Are you aware of other people using this phrase? Because I can no longer remember where it comes from. Um, it, 
doesn't strike a familiar note, but it certainly is a perfectly meaningful phrase, you know, minimal working story in the, in the case of, of perhaps what we're talking about here. So um, it's, it's a sensible phrase, but I don't remember it coming from anybody that, that I would quote. Um, now there's another thing that happens when you break stories down that way. If we have our big story, I'm going to make four layers now just because I think this, is a, 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 this application has more tiers in it. And this is still one story. So the whole app you know, spreads across the room. If, if we undertake to break this story up in technical tasks, we'll say, okay, I'll work on the GUI, um, you work on the middle tier, you work on the database layout, you work on whatever, whatever all these layers are. And then we're going to come together at the end of the week or the end of the month and put this all together and make it something that our customer will understand. There are many things that can happen in each of these layers, and almost every one of them is bad. It's like throwing the football. So we could actually do just exactly the right amount of work. That would be good. We could misunderstand the problem and do too little work so that when these two things integrate, there are massive gaps. We like to avoid that. Programmers particularly like to avoid that because they don't like to be cut short. So the more common thing to do is to do way the hell too much. This will ensure that the system will work, but this work is wasted. If I were to say to you, give me $20,000 now and I will give you a car four years from now, you probably wouldn't do it. You'd be more inclined to say, I'll keep the money and buy a car four years from now if you're that kind of a person, or to say, how about if I give you $100 a month and you give me the car now? But you're not likely to just take all that money or give away all that money and get nothing back. And so this is waste. Now what mostly really happens, of course, is this. We put in a whole bunch of technical stuff that has no meaning whatsoever. We put in a little bunch of stuff that's pretty good, and then we have all this stuff that's missing. So we get the worst of all possible worlds. We waste time and money, and the system won't integrate. Now, if you're going to divide a story into technical tasks, which I recommend against, if you're going to do it, if you make that story first be split, it's kind of a pyramidal story or something here, if you break that story into narrower bits of functionality, then the errors you make are going to kind of be in proportion to that. You're not going to waste so much. You're not going to miss out so much. So even if you cannot, for some reason, figure out a way to actually implement this whole story straight through with, a pro with two programmers or a cycle of paired programmers or something, if you at least split the stories into narrower bits, you will waste less resource, and you will have easier integration, and life will be a better thing. Now this is, all of this stuff is a set of skills that pretty much come, you know, coming out of the box from, you know, from school and coming out of the box from waterfallish kinds of, of methods, these are skills we don't have. You know, the, the practice of doing a minimal working set of stuff is, is not a skill that people just walk in off the street knowing how to do. Um, we are used to doing the other thing. We're used to saying, I must build a framework for this application which will support all things that they might ever ask for. Well, okay, but that's actually wrong because that means I'm going to spend hours and weeks and months and dollars supporting only this much functionality. All that other stuff is a waste. So we need to learn how to do that. We need to learn to, to make things smaller and make stuff happen. Now, if we had that skill, and we had the testing skill that we talked about with the little bug, remember the little bug flying? We still have a problem. And it is, in some senses, I think, the hardest problem to manage in, on the technical side of Agile. And it is, imagine that you were called upon in the very first week to write a feature and to keep writing features and to keep the system growing along some sensible line 
until they actually shipped it. Could anything possibly go wrong with that? Well, we've got the bug thing. We've got that handled with our testing. Um, we've got the too much waste thing going on by trying to keep our stories slim. But has anybody ever worked on a program, probably one that they inherited, that had a really horrible, awful design? A few people have worked on one of those. So if we start with a program whose design is simple enough to actually get the feature, first few features working in a week, that design is not good enough to hold us for the ages. There's no conceivable way that design will last. And therefore, if we keep trying to use that design, we will slow down and slow down and slow down and slow down, and finally we will start making negative progress, and we will never get anywhere. Therefore, it's impossible. No, ha, no, there's another answer. Um, therefore, the design has to improve at the same rate as the software does. If we improve the design too much, we'll push the feature line down. We won't generate as many features as we want. We won't have the return on investment that we want. Our customers will be less happy than they might be, and happiness runs downhill. If we don't do enough design, then we will slow down and we will not deliver as many features as they want, and pretty soon we'll not deliver any features at all, and our customer will be unhappy, and unhappiness runs downhill. Therefore, we must progress the design exactly uh, in line with the feature count which means we have a design that's kind of tracking right along the, f the feature line. Fortunately for us, there's a technique for doing that. Uh, the book on the subject, of course, is Martin Fowler's book called Refactoring. And what refactoring says is you've basically added up a bunch of stuff that you thought was going to make up this nice feature that you had, but you've programmed it in really ugly ways so that at the end of some period of time, this program looks about like that. And that is inevitable, at least on a, on the, on the, at the level of a day, as far as I can tell. I cannot, <coughs> with, with confidence, look at a design that's good for today, put a feature in for tomorrow, but predict how to make the design better to support that feature. The design is probably good enough to just put that feature in, but it makes for a blob on the side of the software. Now, some people are good enough to actually refactor the software, make it neat and clean, and then add more features to it. I'm not very good at that, and I think it comes back to this picture here, or maybe even this one, which is, yeah, I think I know how I should restructure this code, but I will make too much restructuring in one part, and I still won't support the feature that I wanted to put in, because I don't know how a feature is going to look until I write it. I don't know what the software is going to really want to be until it talks to me and says, hi, I shouldn't look like this. So, you know, I'm ugly. So, <laughs> that's, you know, what do you do? I mean, you know, you get up in the morning, you're ugly, you've got to do something about it then. It, you, can't, you can't get born pretty. There's no way to do it. So what we want to do is we want to do this process whereby every now and again, you clean up the design and make it nice and clean again. Now, there's a lot of debate. I think it's time for somebody to write a really cool theoretical paper that proves this. But I believe that, in fact, any design that you would look at that you consider good is good enough for the next feature. That it is not possible to program off in some direction producing a design which we would all look at and say, my, that's a good design. And then a next sensible feature comes along and you say, oh, but the design will not support that. Because good design is about modularity, it's about cohesion, it's about low coupling. I think any design that you would look at that is good is likely to be good enough. If you turn it around, if you are looking at some code that's really horrible and you say, well, we're trying to put this feature in, this design won't support it. If you set that feature aside, erase it from your mind, and then you just assess that design. Say, let's talk about this design and its quality. You will find it is already not good. You didn't need to know that other feature was coming to see that, oh, look, this code is all like that, and oh, look at all this procedural junk here, and look, there's five objects doing exactly the same thing, and none of them does it exactly right. I think you will generally find, and I believe always find, that a design which is inadequate for tomorrow was inadequate today. So 
you need to make this happen, and you can make it happen at kind of whatever pace you, you choose. But if you wait a long time before you bring the design up, you'll slow down. If you bring the design up too soon, you'll slow down. So you're trying to work pretty close to the line. Now, Chet and I work on random programs that we just thought were fun to write. And we work in what we call sessions. And a session is the amount of time between when we get to the bookstore or the Panera or wherever we're going to do our work until it's time to go to lunch. We go to lunch at 11. And we probably never get anywhere by 9 o'clock. So a session is like an hour and a half or two hours. And we do all of our work broken down into, into sessions. And we almost always are successful to say, this. Yeah, I panicked because I couldn't get into the bookstore because I thought it was a quarter to nine and I wanted to go somewhere else and Chet said it's, you know, by the time you hang up the phone, they'll open the door and they did. Um, so we can usually say this is going to be a two session thing and we will very rarely even do a feature that takes us more, we think will take us more than two seconds because we know how terrible we are at estimating. Um, but if we work today on our session and we do not clean up the code at the end of the day, when we sit down tomorrow, we can tell that we're going slower than we did the day before. Why? Because we pay attention. We work in tiny chunks, and we pay attention. And so here we are. We code, and we code, and we code, and it's 11 o'clock, and we have to break. If we don't refactor that code before we split, and if we then go ahead and just try to put our next feature in, instead of saying, we better clean this code up before we go ahead, we can tell in one day, in one one and a half to two hour session, that we're slowed down. Now that is not because we are geniuses, because one of us isn't, but <laughs> it is because we are practiced at feeling when the code is responding to us well, and feeling when the code is pushing back, and feeling when the code is saying, I suck, which it will say if you just listen carefully. So all of this to me ties together to say that the business problem that that we want to solve for them is just to be predictable. And that to be predictable, we have to do this thing I call running tested features that I erased all possible occurrences of that. I'll put it up just once more. Because it is the thing to remember. And I want to try something, which is that if I talk and write at the same time, I almost always screw up, but I didn't. Um, usually when I talk and write at the same time, I write gibberish. And as far as I know, I do not spout obscenities, but that is possible also. Um, so if we're going to do that, we are called upon to have a set of skills that we were probably not born with, that we certainly didn't learn in school, at least when I was in school. And I haven't, with rare occasions, when I talk to certain professors at the, at the Agile conference, for example, there are a few who are trying to teach this, but they mostly don't know it because they haven't done this long enough to really know how to do it. Let, you know, they've been reading about it and hearing us talk about it and trying it in their little classrooms and stuff. Um, so there's kind of no source for this in our history until we try to do an Agile project. But we need to do small features. Ah, you see? I wasn't even talking, I did it wrong. Um, we need to do short iterations. The, uh, this thing represents the work I've been doing for the last two years in taking scrum teams who are working one month sprints and not shipping any features at the end again and again and again. The first thing I always tell them to do is try to do one week sprints. And they say, well, that's insane. If we can't do anything in a month, how could we also do anything in a week? Well, the answer is, on Monday, you can see till Friday. And on the first of the month, you can't see till the end of the month. And so on Monday, you will have a sense of how little work you can really do in a week. And the truth is, you can't do very much work in a month either. You can only do four weeks worth, and that isn't very much. You just have to do it, and you have to complete it. So we want to do short iterations. We want to do lots of testing. 
The best testing technique I know is test-driven development, um, which, as far as I know, is the work of Kent Beck, although he probably learned a lot of it from Ward Cunningham. Um, there are three, at least, books out on test-driven development now. There's Dave Estelle's book, and I believe there's one from some guys in Europe. Um, so I think there's actually three test-driven development books. The neat thing about the test development technique is it doesn't feel to a programmer like testing. And most programmers don't really like testing, particularly don't like automating testing. And test-driven development isn't like that. It's like a change, game of challenge response. Write a test, see if it runs. No, ha, damn, I thought it would run. Make it run. Cool, write another test. And so it's, like, it's just like this little game, and it's got a rhythm to it that to me is like rollerblading. You're just kind of going along. You're not putting out a lot of effort, but you're making good time, and it's very, very comfortable and smooth. So the TDD practice is much better than unit testing, which is, you know, the, the obvious alternative. And I think better than nothing. I really shouldn't put a line through it, but it's nothing compared to that. And then customer acceptance testing. You need two lines of defense. Bugs are too tricky. If I'm blind to some defect, maybe my customer won't be. If my customer's blind to some defect, maybe I won't be. If a defect does slice through these two deals, we both have something to learn. Customer should write the test that should have been written. The programmer should write the test that should have been written. And then think about it and say, hmm, what does this tell me? Oh, I see. Whenever this happens, I should. And then there's probably tests elsewhere that need to be strengthened up. You should learn every moment when a bug comes along. Um, and design improvement or refactoring. Now, you could write a million other skills. I mean, all the stuff we already know how to do in programming, all the stuff that is in all the books about patterns and, you know, everything, design stuff, all the stuff that's out there, of course, we want to know all that. These, to me, are the skills that are most lacking in teams just starting out to do Agile. They are mostly easy to attain because they can primarily be done by practice. Doesn't take a lot of deep study. Refactoring is a little tricky, but you can do most refactoring without knowing all those 150-odd refactorings that Martin's now got up on his website. Um, I get by with probably two or three refactorings for almost all I do. I extract method, maybe extract class, and whatever the third one is, I don't remember. Uh, because everything comes down to pull out a little chunk of code and make it work in the new environment and then wrap it with some stuff that makes it prettier and next thing you know, you've got a couple of classes. So all this cycle is, is if we are to make our customers happy, we, the only way I can see to do it is to show them software that grows. The way to do that is sure all of the scrum meetings and XP planning meetings and all that stuff. But ultimately, what it comes down to is, as developers, among the skills we need to have, our, our chief weapons are these <laughs> ones here. And that is my story. Hold on now. Who's responsible for making the table? That's what I want. I think that because of this chart, the customer or the money people are. But we have to make it possible to make the date, which we can only do if we learn how to do this. If we don't learn how to do this, they don't have the information to reduce scope or extend the date. And all they can do is, as in the little article on my website, hold our feet to the fire. Um, and uh, that's unpleasant, because nobody likes hot feet. Apparently, there are a couple of questions. Can I do some questions over there? I and then, because then we're going to do all the impossible questions, so there's something or something. Uh, out of all the problems that run into our project, one thing you didn't mention is uh, possible feature creep or change, or if um, you, how do you if deal you, with that? If you're really doing Agile <coughs> with a customer with you, as you're supposed to do in all the Agile methods, not just the program, that won't happen. If you're really communicating in terms of story as features done, your story is very simple. It's, you know, in the case of an XP planning game, we have a, a lovely game which everybody should bring us in and have us uh, run for them. You've taken all these little stories and you've laid them out on the calendar. Here's this week and here's that week and so on. They come in and they 
they say, I've got this wonderful new glorious story. Glorious new story. And I just need you to do it. You say, as you've probably noticed, we are producing exactly three stories per week. That's why it's a tenth story. More likely, by the way, I would like the team to be producing one or two stories per programmer per week. Because small stories are better. So we're producing 30 stories, you know, whatever the number is. Um, and we'll be glad to do this. Just tell us which one to take off the table. And they'll say, well, couldn't you just do it? And we'll say, we'll be glad to put it on the table, but I believe you should plan for this minute. Now, there is, so I have seen every team I've ever worked with who actually does that. It says, here's the matrix, pick what you want, take off the things you think we can't do. They'll push back for a while and say, must go faster, must go faster. If you just say, I believe you've got to look at the data, we'll go as fast as we can, we've got to look at the data, they'll figure out that there's no point in asking for stuff that isn't going to be done. Now, there is, however, something very important that we need to be able to do it. I'm going to use your inexpensive cards for this thing. Because the idea is to get as much good stuff into the product as you possibly can, and by the way, to get a deal as early as you possibly can, we're going to go down that path, they might come along and say, well, I really want both of these. These are both very important. Technically and business-wise, it's possible to do this find the essence of two big stories and make it into one little thing. Get creative. Now that's, to me, way up in the range of black belt. And um, it is something that comes naturally to people, maybe it simply doesn't come naturally. Um, the mere <coughs> fact of saying, look, philosophy is three, you better plan for three. Yeah, we're trying to go faster, we better plan for three. That alone is enough to get every customer I've ever worked with to start saying, oh, you mean I have to take one off before I put one on the table? Good job. Okay. Well, yeah, let's take a break, and uh, then we'll do um, arbitrary questions. Okay. So yeah. Good evening.
the CIO of Chrysler, became the CIO of Daimler Chrysler, and was given the responsibility of saving millions of dollars in synergy savings by merging the two IT groups. It operated in completely different ways. But she didn't have, for all private purposes, any budget to save in her group because she didn't have very many self-funded projects. They were all offset. And so the project was under deep economic pressure. Um, that wasn't certainly the only thing that was wrong with it. It had deployed and it had paid one big payroll and, a, and portions of another. And portions of another and it also a tiny one. Um, but it was not moving as rapidly as it should have, in my opinion. And the, the customer who took over for the first customer was quoted after the project was stopped as saying, I never really thought that the point was to ship the product. But we, you know, we knew it was, that it wasn't going as it ought to be because they would, we tried to get them to put together what an XP is called a release plan, which is the plan that says, here's all the cards on the table, this is what we're going to be done. And uh, they wouldn't do it, the customer wouldn't do it. So I believe that if the probably the prudent thing was for me to go and knock on the door of the CIO's office, which I could have done, <coughs> and say, this project is broken, you have to fix it. I believe that that would have instantly cost me my job. I believe that at the time, and for some reason, I had too much fear to go and do that. Um, but I think it was what had to be done was to say, Sue, this is not working, and you've got to fix it or stop it. <coughs> but we figured that they would stop it, and we were having a good time. And, you know, so we let, it, we let it drag on a little more than it probably should have. In addition, we may have some pretty serious technical, a pretty serious technical problem. It is always a bad idea to rewrite an existing program. I mean, we all want to as techies, but it's always a bad idea. Invariably, I'm, you know, I would just, you know, make a lot of money if I could just bet this is a bad idea every time. Perhaps maybe it was a good idea somewhere. We were writing this program that had to exactly duplicate whatever the other payroll did, which of course is changing over time because, as it turns out, payroll is not static. And we were doing it by just writing a program that was going to bulk, come in and replace the other payroll. What we should have done instead is what Martin Fowler calls the strangler, which is we should have gone in and found some piece of the old payroll that was particularly ugly in the COBOL programs, excised it, coded it up in a good way, and then sent that number through as a transaction, pulling the guts out of the old payroll until it turned into a transaction process. It, had we done that, we would have had our friend so firmly implanted in that project that they could have never stopped. <laughs> 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 I think we would do things. 
things very differently. You've used a three-week iteration. I don't know of anybody in extreme programming that's using a three-week iteration anymore. They're all in the range of one to two. Um, I bet we were doing a lot of things really neatly that you know that some teams don't do. I know our acceptance testing, you know, kicked on practically everybody. But I bet we find things now that we would look at and say, oh, that's bad. That's that's nothing like what we understand now. <coughs> I hope so. I need to. I've done nothing. <laughs> Another question, Matt? Yes. Uh, can you guys hear me? Okay. We'll try. Okay. You said you can hang out there and pull it down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, my question required a little bit of setup. So uh, let's say that uh, this is a testing question. <clears throat> say that I'm a library developer and I'm trying to develop a set of, let's say, data structures that clients of my library can use, and part of what the, my clients are getting out of those data structures are uh, guarantees, algorithmic constraints on how those data structures work. For example, if you use this structure, you're going to get insertions in linear time, and you're going to get sorts in logarithmic space, or whatever. So let's say that I'm also um, a tester who is, uh, subscribes to the philosophy of test via public interface only, which I personally I think many other people in the room are too. So, <clears throat> in order, um, if I'm testing these data structures and I'm just pumping in a bunch of numbers and letting them rip and then getting some numbers out, how do I know? I mean, I can tell that my numbers are sorted or whatever, but I can't necessarily know via that public interface well, exactly so the constraints from fulfilled. Are you a tester, not a developer who is doing testing? I am doing tester and development of these. Um, well, I guess I, I can't imagine any way to do test driven development only by the public interface. I certainly, if I found myself wanting to test something on the private interface, I would extract it into another class and make it public so they can test it. Or because I and I believe Chet don't have much respect for public and private, I might just declare the thing public or friend or protected or one of those other things and test it that way. When it's a library, I ultimately got to get it protected again, of course, because yes. I don't really want to export a bunch of random things that people might call. Um, I think if you're going to test performance, you've got to write performance tests that, you know, insert one thing, a hundred things, a thousand things, ten thousand things, a million things in the time. Um, or, and I would be mostly inclined to be in this way, um, have to rely on data structures of known performance that you have given, and you have to rely on the <coughs> theoretical arguments made in books like Knuth and things you know, between now and then, then and now, that say this is the algorithm and therefore it's order of, you know, n over 2 or whatever it is. Um, but I don't think there's any magical way other than just do performance testing to test that. Well, my question, I, I suppose, is in, in respect to the second solution you proposed, which is I have a known algorithm and it's been proven to operate within these constraints. How do I actually, if I, for whatever reason, need to develop the code for those algorithms, you know, I, I came up with a new one or whatever, I need to prove, I mean, I need to know that I wrote the code to reflect the proven algorithm on paper. And so my, my question really is... Well, you can either test it or inspect it, and I don't know any other way. I mean, well, actually, there is, the, there is the hard way, which is to really go through your own formal mathematical proof of that code, but that's so hard I don't do it. But if I know an algorithm that's written up in, you know, collected algorithms, or if it's written up in Knuth or someplace like that, I'll sit down with a bunch of people and say, let's walk through this and look at it. And then I can measure it. I would always measure it. And if it seemed to work, then it would work. Now, I wonder, I, I would think that to be a, a not an uncommon thing if you're writing a library, but in general, <coughs> what I find as a, as a more general rule for performance is that customers have rules about performance like this, that's too slow. <laughs> and it comes down to measure how slow it is, figure out why it's slow, the profiler or something like that, and then find a library that's got an algorithm and that shooting faster and then test it again. Because at the surface of the application, it's easy to tell whether it's sped up or not. Well, easy 
even there, again, the customer I'm working with right now is processing um, 100,000 transactions a second. And they want to know why every now and again it slows down and takes four seconds to do one. And uh, that's, you know, no one knows how to do that. Once, you know, once, once you try to figure out what's going on in the system that's that big, you're doomed. There is a bug in their code, and it's a bug that could be found with a test that's this big, but you're not going to find it by looking at a transaction log from something that's running 100,000 transactions a second. So I don't think there's an easy answer. I don't know to test it and prove it. Quite tough. I guess mostly you don't try and work that way. It would be, yes. in most of my code, I don't have to do that. Most of my code is going to be simple and not have to be that way. And parts of it are hard. There's a lot of things. This ain't called easy programming. It's, it's called bad. Hey, on, uh, on that same kind of topic you talked about, but let's see if it's infrastructure for that uh, <coughs> problem. Because you want to do public interface only, and not necessarily public interface that the customer can get, but between a bunch of different objects and classes that you broke it down to solve the problem internally, and then use the term. Once you get it all done, you want to protect it again because you don't want to expose all those objects and little inners and stuff like that. So you want to develop responsibly, test responsibly, but you only want to expose the golden methods to the customer. If you're doing anything that would actually modify code at build time to shield things like change access to classes, make it private instead of public protected, or something like that. After you have some language, but I know teams that actually do that in C with macros. I, I can imagine doing it with a preprocessor. I could imagine declaring these methods star temporary, star private public, and write a script that ran over it and declare them all back. But I don't know of a tool other than the macros in C++ to do that. I've seen how to define private public. Yeah, that kind of stuff. I'm I think it's a blast to be in the testing world, though, to ship something you didn't really test. Life is tough. <laughs> <laughs> you, I would do everything I could to factor the things so that I could test it, and I personally don't have the least concern about declaring something public. If, you, if, I, if I want to test it badly enough, I'll declare it public and name it, do not ever call this method under pain of death. <laughs> and maybe not even print it in the manual. But, if I got to test it, I'd rather test it than stand on some rule that says never declare a method public and don't make it public. But I would guess most times so that if that's the case, if you've got a method that's like that, there's probably something wrong with the program anyway. Because why is all of this complex functionality inside of this object covered up by the public interface and not available? If it's complicated enough to test, it probably deserves to be somewhere in a class of its own. So it's, you always have to look at, back at the code and say, Can, is this really, is this, is this pain of intelligence? I think that's fairly advanced. I don't think anybody's written a lot about it yet. But I think it's, the code's right. It says, if I want to test a bunch of private stuff, this class is probably too tight for But it's only a guess. I could be wrong, although that's not the good path. I have a question about breaking up. Um, sorry to do it. I'm sorry to do it. <laughs> no, go on. <laughs> <laughs> I think I heard that. I have a question about uh, breaking up the user stories. And for example, um, we're developing an ERP system for a customer. And that customer comes to us and says, Throughout the system, we've got this problem where two people are editing the same thing, whether it's a customer or an existing order or whatever. If they're editing it at the same time, then we get a race to finish last situation. So we want to implement some kind of blocking throughout the whole system. How do we break that down? First of all, anytime we make a change that comes in line as we have to make changes in the whole system. That tells us that there is an idea in the system, in this case, getting at a customer record or whatever kind of record this is, that is spread all over the software. This idea is spread all over the software. When a single idea is spread all over the software, that is a design flaw. 
because software is supposed to be cohesive, which means that a single concept should be in a single location. So when my software starts telling me things like that, that tells me I've got to find a way to bring that spread out object together. Now I will unfortunately have to build the little kernel item that does the locking and return the record, whatever it is, and change all those guys to point to it. The sooner I see that, the better it is. If I see it after about the third time I do it and build a little security object, whatever you want to call it, that's better than if I don't notice that until four centuries into the project because it will be, I'll still have to make the change in use once. After that, everybody knows to do that. If we've done the encapsulation right, there will be no way, literally no way, to refer to that record other than through this class, and therefore you cannot get to it without, uh, without the, the, uh, that guy you're reading. But in general, the deal is, if somebody says, we're going to have to change the system all over, that's one of those examples of this design was bad before we started. Because something all over is called duplication and it is a sign of bad design. So you wipe the boat once, funnel it together into a you know, security kernel or whatever you want to call it. And you, know, you know anything smarter than that? No. Bummer. It's all the movie. Um, so you guys have been at this XP thing for 10 years plus or minus. And, uh, and uh, written books and done a lot of, had a lot of experience in my my question is yes how have yeah. you seen, next question <laughs> <laughs> how have you seen XP evolve over those ten years and assuming you don't assume that uh, XP is done evolving uh, because embrace change is sort of the model how how do you see XP evolving in the future where are the opportunities for XP to be improved on given your ten years of history. If there's a pattern of change in the XP thread of that, in my opinion, it is to tighten up the feedback loop. When we first started doing it, we thought the feedback loop was tight enough. We thought that writing unit tests instead of tests first was good enough. We thought that three week iterations was good enough. Um, what we're seeing is that tighter loops is better. The depressing thing about uh, Agile Software Club, or maybe it's not because of that license number, is that most teams that are trying to do Scrum or any Agile method or XP, if we walk in and we see what they're doing, they're still not doing what it said in that book in 1998, whenever that book came out. They're still not really testing everything. They're still not sitting with their customer in the room. Their programmers are not all in the same room. How many teams do not have the programmers all in the same room right here? Everybody else has got all the programmers in one room. Pop those hands up, I want to see that. Programmers in the same room? Same room. Programmers not in the same room. Great, that's wonderful. It's very rare, it's very, very rare. Um, so a lot of what we're seeing is just, you know, um, I want to say that, that Vex's book, second edition book, I want to say, is focused a little more on trying to explain to business people why, how these things work and why they want to do them. I find it to be a philosophical strong book that I can get into and it kind of explains why this stuff works. But I mean, personally, toward, you know, if you can just do these dozen things until you're really good at them then you would actually know how to do software well, well enough that you could kind of branch off and do things you want to do. I don't know, do you see any things that are likely to happen, changes that are, that are coming? What about tooling? There's, I was just going to say, there's Eclipse and some of those. Some of those tools that help you at, at the lower level, you know, that they, the programmer hands-on level have gotten much, much better. You know, back when we first started, we had to write a lot of the tools we were using. You know, we had to write Unit testing frameworks, we had to write uh, acceptance testing frameworks. Unbuilt scripts and all that stuff. All that kind of stuff, to the extent that we needed them in small talk, we had to do them ourselves. Uh, I think there's always been a desire among people to have tools to help you add to more project level. In fact, there was just an odd conversation on the XP list over the past week or so 
about somebody who wanted the tool to help them do something that none of us on the list could life understand. Life cycle management. Livestock management, we couldn't understand why we wanted such a thing. It was sort of like I need a, an automated cat shaper. You know, I really don't need <laughs> uh, I have a cat, and I'm kind of hurting the so I don't even know. Uh, so I think the tool stuff has changed. And you know, certainly over, over, the, over the past 10 years, we've seen a lot of things come and go. We, you know, we started out with people saying, you can't do this, it will never work. And that was followed closely on the heels by some people who said, you can't do that, it will never work, except the best to do work, which I admitted many years ago. Uh, and, and so we've seen those sorts of things happen. So, And we've also seen... Uh, an expansion of where people thought XP was happening. And when we first started talking about these things, we said smallish projects, 10, 12-ish people working in this sort of way. And we have seen people be successful with projects with 10 times that many people spread around the world doing things in a way that we would we would call XP. Care to name names on those? On the projects? <laughs> the ones that are doing it great. Uh, it's, it's not up to me, I think, to point them out. You know, if you look around, you'll see people from those things posting and talking about it. Uh, somewhere there's a list of allegedly active XP projects that I, I don't have in my fingertips. But I, I think, you know, when, they, when we first started talking about it, we said, here's where we think this works well. And we've seen people expand that. And we've seen people expand it in ways that we think are probably odd. And, and so I think it's going to be kind of a pulsing situation where uh, XP kind of pulses out into a new kind of realm and then we see how, what those people have done that is not true to the original vision, I think, and discover that maybe that vision it was was better than what those guys were doing and, and recalibrating our thoughts back to the, the core actors. Now, there are a couple of things happening that, that I um, do not like. Um, a lot of the tool stuff that's happening there's a whole bunch of tools on my website whose purpose it is to manage your XP project. I'm ahead of that list of tools, I have about five articles pointed to that are basically saying your issue isn't to have a tool to run your project, your project should be run you eyeball eyeball with the people for the project, unless you're doing a thousand person project, in which case you need a lot more than XP to do it. So there's a lot of tool stuff happening, and the reason there's a lot of tool stuff happening is programmers like to write tools, and programmers are generally not really good at talking to, to human beings, and so they think, maybe if I wrote the right tool, I wouldn't have to talk to people. I could just send them emails and stuff. So the tool thing, I think, is moving in a not entirely okay direction. Um, but there's a number of us who are just crazy enough to say, no, first try it on the cards, and when the cards don't work, then do something else. Another thing that I'm not fond of is that there is a, a sort of a watering down trend, and that's coming from two different Path. First of all, when, I, when a movement starts to pick up, it just inherently gets watered down because everybody says, "Yeah, we've been doing that all the time. We're doing that. Oh, we're doing XP." Um, and I, you know, I did it. You know, I, I, you know, done it. So you say, "Well, are you programming?" And they say, "Well, not exactly." And then we write tests first. Well, you know, sometimes it just gets watered down by the virtual fact that there's more people doing it, and it's hard to maintain that period. There is also trend that I personally consider uh, deplorable, which is the uh, exemplified primarily by the two-day, two-and-a-half-day, whatever it is, Scrum Master training course, after which you are a certified Scrum Master. You take this course, and you get a certified Scrum Master thing, and you get, a, you get six million uh, continuing education unit credits, and you imagine that you can go back and teach and make the projects come to life perfectly, because now you know how to hold meeting. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, the thing that's, and I swear that the thing that is most depressing about that to me is not that the people who are teaching those courses are making a lot of money, although they are. Um, it is a good course. It is a wonderful course. You'll learn a lot in that course. Just enough to get yourself in deep and serious trouble because it is as if you took a two and a half day course in neurosurgery. Um, there's more to it than can be covered. You get a lot of stuff out of it. That proper way to hold the striker saw. Yeah, that that trend is bothering me because now there are two or three more advanced courses. And I don't think this is about courses. I think this is about doing. You don't you can't go and sit in a room like this one and listen to somebody up here talk and 
really change the way of your reflection. You've got to go back home and do different stuff. The little four-week sprint is good, having a little stamp of eating, having a little pigs, you know, chickens and all that, that's all cool. But it really comes down to do you do all of that stuff that has to be done to make a project come to life. And that trend of the of the methods kind of losing their edge. I, uh, I expect to continue and it makes me mad. I think certainly any tool which reduces the amount of face-to-face -face communication is probably a bad thing. Uh, there are days when I would be happy to rip on why I think cruise control was a bad idea because of it. Uh, even though the guys who wrote cruise control were friends of mine. Uh, and I think it's a wonderful tool and does some interesting things, but do it by hand for a while. Have a machine where you take your code over to and integrate it and run the tests and know what happened. Bomb yourself in the head. yourself in the head when it goes wrong. And stand up and say, I've had a good build, guys, because you're all in the room with the rest of the team. Or, gee whiz, I just broke things. Come over to somebody for your help. As opposed to, I wrote some code, I checked it in, and I'll get an email later to tell me how things happen because, and that way I don't have to talk to anybody. And I can do this at midnight and, and, and bump it up. Do it, do it the old fashioned way. Do it by hand and discover whether your builds really are better when you, when you need that goal. You know, there's certainly projects with enough, with a large enough body of people. The first, you know, the reason that cool got built was because we had 80 some people on a project, half of whom were in Australia. If you have that problem, then you can't have the guy flying in from Melbourne to check in his code and run it on the machine in Chicago. Okay. But if you're all in a building in Ann Arbor on the same floor in the one big room, mm, I'd have to think awful hard about whether I need to install it. Even though it's a great tool and the guys who wrote it are great guys. Any questions? Harold, I'll be have you seen situations where Agile methodologies or XP itself has fallen short um, development, types of development that aren't quite suited for Agile or XP? It depends on, it depends on what you mean. Um, if you think about <coughs> what the practices are, it's kind of difficult to say you should, there are cases where you shouldn't do them. When would it be a bad idea to have comprehensive tests for my code owned by the programmers? When would it be a bad idea to have comprehensive tests for the code owned by the customers? When would it be a bad idea for people to work together? When would it be a bad idea for us to all be able to understand the code and move any of us among the code however it had to be done? When would it be a bad idea to have a coding standard? When would it be a bad idea for everybody to work together in the same room? When would it be a bad idea to have small releases running on short cycles? Never. But there are things there are a million skills that go into software development, of which those 13 practices, or even the 20 million or however many in the middle, um, are just scratching the surface. So they are, I think, always valuable, but they are never sufficient. There's lots more skill that you that, that we need to have if you're going to do stuff. We need to have skill in planning. We need to have skill in written communication and spoken communication. We need to know how to program effectively whatever programming language we're working in, or, 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 or lots of stuff. If I were working in a, uh, uh, well, if you think, uh, Alistair Coburn's crystal uh, model of the agile software development, um, Andrew, uh, Alistair wrote this imagining that the book was being told to him by this, I believe, probably very beautiful woman named Crystal, who was out in the field, and in the other book, she's out there, and then she writes him a little email saying, Alistair, I'm out here in the field. This is what's happening. And I think he's having fantasies at all about it. But, <laughs> uh, but he has dimensioned projects into small projects with not much risk, uh, larger levels of risk, loss of, of a fair amount of money, loss of serious money that would put you out of business, loss of life, loss of whatever you value on in life, and two programmers up to a billion programmers. If you get up into loss of life projects with hundreds of programmers, You've got to do more than it would say at XP, you've got to do more than it would say at Scrum. Because you've got integration problems, you've got testing problems, and you've got code inspection problems, uh, all this stuff. So you would have to add in a lot of stuff. But I don't think there's uh, a project I've ever been on where I would take away 
XP list. Every, everything I've ever done, which has included operating systems, compiler generation, database systems, payrolls, taxes, everything I've ever done, I would do with those practices and with whatever else was called for in that situation. Here, that's my theory. Yes, um, I work for a company and we have a commercial train brand product and we've adopted internally some of the add on um, things internally. And the problem we're running into is that the more customers you have, the more difficult it is to ship that the communication process both internally to create a release that goes out to 600 customers as well as facilitate that communication process of the product itself. And so there's a lot of reluctance, not just from, from internally, but also from the customers. You know, they can have a weekly update. They can put a, put a, put a chunky output in pieces of decisions organization. But also, you know, we have two big releases every year, and we have a big party, and then you know, we work for four months sort of slack, and then the last two months you get off a big party and make a big splash. So it's, it's difficult to reconcile those two philosophies. There's a, there's a there's a complicated question. What you know, if you if you have a big tree back product and people you know people don't want a new version of it every day. Um, many times I have sat down with clients who said we only ship our product six months, you know, once every six months, and the customers wouldn't take it any more often than that. Um, when I've drilled into that question of why don't they want it any more than every, every six months. Um, I have occasionally gotten the answer, well, you see, two years ago we shipped a version that basically formatted everybody's hard drive. And uh, they're really mad at us and they would really rather have <coughs> ship once a year so that we wouldn't screw them over the way we did back in month six. Um, so sometimes that's an issue that the, that the, the company cannot ship reliable enough software as a record of not shipping reliable enough software to make them happy. But there are other issues. If I'm sending out uh, Microsoft Office and, them send, and my customer's pricing corporation. The support load of that is I've got to install this thing on every computer in the building, or else I've got to support two versions and all this stuff happens. And a lot of the computers, you know, well, it gets it gets very difficult. In a situation where the business will not, for any reason, ship frequently, I believe it's important that the development team is shipping shippable software every week. So that every week you can say, here's the list to me, why don't you send it up? And I'll say, well, because the customers are free. Okay, but it's ready. Microsoft has just announced that they are not going to make Christmas with Vista. <clears throat> I will wager you that's not because there are five more features that aren't working that they want for Christmas and that the other 50,000 features are all working. I will wager that Vista doesn't work very well yet. And if you talk to anybody who's got a beta copy of it, they will assure you that that is true. Well, why didn't they have a perfectly runnable version that had everything in it except whatever the five least important features were that they could ship for Christmas? Okay, they only want to ship it once every two years or for seven years or however often they ship. <laughs> but they're not doing that because people aren't interested. Because every new computer that would be made in this country most of which are sold to people on the Christmas holidays, could have had Vista on it. And now it won't. This is a trillion dollars. I mean, you know, Microsoft's not going to get it because the program isn't ready to go. Not because of any other deal. It's just not ready. And so that's the thing I want to do. I want to be in a situation where if, if it does take longer to do what they want, then, we, then they ask, which it will, that everything that's in there is perfect. So I would be in a development situation. I just try to ship every week, be ready to go every week, and just every week say, you could send this out to you. Yeah, Kent, one of, one of the things he taught us many years ago was that technical people should make technical decisions, and business people should make business decisions. And I think when to send the software out to the people who are paying for it is a business decision. And we, as technical people, should be able to support whatever answer they came up with. And as Ron said, if they came out tomorrow and said, we want to start shipping out whatever version you have as of last night, we should be ready to do that. And I said, that's sort of what we do. This stuff is there ready to go. Yeah.
Yeah. That's a specific. That's right. And that's, as a technical person, that's all I am responsible for. Now, I think that over time, most companies are going to discover that shipping software sooner means revenue sooner. And if they learn that we really are ready to do that, that the company itself will learn to speed up its cycle, will learn to shift its software. There are technical things we can do. For example, the, the one of the companies I mentioned where they said we, we once shipped out the software and screwed over all of our clients and they kind of don't want to see any more versions. They were an antivirus company. Mm -hmm. They ship out software every day. Just not all of it. Just not the engine. And so they have found a way to at least ship much of the important part of their stuff. So, you know, you come up in the morning and there's a little pop up on your screen that says, I have been your, your uh, virus definitions. And you almost don't care. Except, of course, McAfee just sent one out that um, destroyed all their computers that way. And all the computers. So there are people who are a little happy with them. But if you do that well, you can at least begin to shift some of your business value forward. And the business value for, a, for an antivirus company is in, I'm the first on the street with, with the cover for whatever you might be worried about. If you read about it, you know, in the newspaper, you've already got the protection. And, you know, if I were, the only thing I would do different than those guys do right now is I would be sending out updates that made sure to pop up on the screen saying things like, remember that virus that you read about, the Trojan 965 state? We actually protected you from that. Start last year, two weeks ago last Thursday, just to kind of bring it home to them that you're just saving them. You know, it's, it's really scary to be in a situation where you know, they're sending you the software. You know, uh, back at C3, we use an object database called Gemstuff. And they would send us out updates for the Gemstone database product every now and then. And, and we got into a habit of when the tape came in, we'd put it in a drawer for two weeks. Because more times than you would like, a day or two later after getting the tape, we'd get a panic phone call saying, don't install that tape we just sent you. There'll be another one in the mail. You know, and, and after you get one of those, you learn to, to be kind of wary about these guys. You know, and so we would spend in an, in an ordinary amount of time debugging their code and trying to teach them about the practices we were learning in XP in order to make the product they were selling us that we were building our software on top of work better. And so that was a very, very odd situation. Uh, you also find, you know, that, that when you find these companies that say, we only ship out the software twice a year, or we really just internally release the software twice a year. It's amazing if you just bore in just a little bit deeper, how many times did you actually release the software last year? And how many tapes did you really mail out? How many how many times did you, product, did you promote the product to production last year? And you'll discover that it wasn't twice, it was 37. You know, we had two releases and it took us an average of 15 tries to get it out. You know, and if you're actually releasing the project, you go through all the work to release 37 times, then you know, why can't you have a little actual new features each time as opposed to a batch of empty features? <laughs> yeah. I work with a prospect right now that told me in the, in the meeting we had that they have a greater than 100% rollback rate, by which they mean they roll back each release more than once before it gets out. I thought that wasn't too good. Um, in our in the, uh, Chuck, we, Chuck and I uh, just be famous uh, excuse me, small card planning game. One of the things that comes out is you've got this project and you can do as many features as you want to do and then ship it. And they've asked to have it shipped after six months or something. And if you did all the features and then shipped, you would get a return on investment that looked like that because every month after that, you know, you get a billion dollars from people buying it. <coughs> and one of the exercises we do in the game is we say, well, what if you just did the most valuable features you could for a month or two and then shipped it then and never again? Never put the other features in again. You get a curve that looks like this. Now there's two important things to know about that curve. First of all, in here, a two-month company's got more money than a six-month company. Now that doesn't even count market position, first to the market, all of that stuff. You've got revenue, they don't. <coughs> if you're a small company, that's a big deal. If you're a big company like, say, Ford, GM, or Northwest Airlines, it's also 
The other thing that's true is this split up here in the examples we do um, on a nine month project, which is the actual length we do, the line, the curve will cross out about 12 or 13 months. Across 14 years. Yes. Oh, no, out, out there somewhere. Which means that in terms of total revenue, even though these guys are growing at this rate, the early shipping companies actually had in total accrued revenue until the difference between 6 and 14, eight months out. So the value of shipping early is incredible because people give you money when you get when you no software or you get value. It's an internal logic. You start getting the value only when you ship it. And so of all of the things, that, all the mistakes I've made that, meet, that are the fundamental causes for me not being a millionaire, I suspect that I'm just kind of a jerk sometimes. Um, if I had learned that lesson, which was ship early and ship often, I wouldn't talk to the likes of you people because I'd be there. <laughs> <laughs> let's take I mean, I a whole bunch more questions next time you had your hand up. So, let's take so my team just learned that we should have uh, broken up a couple stories the hard way because we didn't finish them at the end of the iteration. Um, but then the customer says, you were so close, what, but you're not counting all that work that you did because we didn't, we didn't say we got 15 done, we only got uh, uh, 11 done. There was these two two-point stories, right? But you were, so they want to know how do, they, how do they account for that because they feel like when we re-estimate to say finish what's left on the story, we might no, say... It will only be three dollars or something. <laughs> 15 minutes to go. It's going to well, I, I tell customers that if the story is not done at the end of the iteration, even if they swear to you that it was only three minutes more work, if you just held this meeting for three minutes, we could have fixed things. That the customer's job is to basically give them no credit for that and to look very sad. <laughs> that if the team had come in on Friday morning before that Friday afternoon, and said, we're not going to get this story done, but if we could cut it to this much feature instead of that much feature, we could get that much done. So that it goes from being a you know 10 worth of done to a nine. That actually is something that the professional can understand. 90% done, but it looks like a smaller feature than the 10 done. That the 90% of the story, 100% done. You know, that is, so that you have 90% of the story, 100% done, that if, the, if they have been renegotiated, then the customer should smile and be happy. Thank you, you got my story done. It's a smaller story, but that just means the customer did it wrong. Now, from a velocity view, from a planning view, um, I would not stick with the strict yesterday's weather that said, well, we got 12 stories done instead of 15, therefore, let's sign up for 12. Because I think what a team ought to really be, I think, I think that the yesterday's weather and all those other velocity measures are a rule of thumb by which you don't try and do 20 things when you just have 15. But I think that the real point of a planning meeting is for the team, as a team, to look at everything on the board, say, we can do that, and by God we will to make that commitment. The thing that I think is the best aspect of Scrum, which many people don't realize, is at the end of a sprint planning meeting in Scrum, the team is supposed to be committed on how or high water to get that work done. They never are supposed to sign up for more than they can do. They're supposed to absolutely be, you know, if the sky don't fall, we're going to get this done. So I like that, and I think that the wise team would look at the thing and say, look, I got two hours on my story. I can pop that thing out. Maybe I'll even come in tomorrow and clean it up just because I feel like I was such an idiot for what I did Thursday. Um, so let's. Assume we can do 14, even though we only make a lot of time. So I would plan from my gut, but I would have the customer do bad doggy every time I did ship something and didn't really go ship. Bad program. I'm going to focus. You mentioned the, the second connect you book a couple of times. Yes. And I guess I've heard various things. I don't know which is 
not the real answer. Um, I do not like the second book. I think it's better explained, but I think that when I read it, it tells me things that I, you know, it helps full, fulfill my 10 years worth of experience understanding. Um, I think in the hands of somebody who doesn't know what XP user was, I think it's, I personally feel it's too soft. <coughs> but that's just what I think. You know, I like to think it was edgy. And it is intentionally not edgy. But that's, that's me. I'm old and I'm curmudgeonly. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, my, my question to the teams I coach is how good do you want to be and when? And so I want teams that are really striving to do excellent stuff. I don't find that it inspires that. But it is a much better explanation of what's going on with the other one. So it's philosophically strong and I think practically I'm not saying But I could be wrong. I could be entirely wrong. So you should do both of you. He's old and he's curmudgeonly and he's driving back to Ann Arbor tonight. So we should probably make this uh, officially over. And turn on if he's going and Cheddar's willing to stay around a little bit longer. It'd be great to take some more questions. I think. I hate to interrupt that. If you're honest, I'll go ahead and chase my way. I'll be right back with you. Uh, quick announcement our April meeting is going to be on a technique called Presenter First that we developed with uh, developers at uh, Dexray and Recorder uh, Machinery, where, which, which gets at this problem of how do you organize a large, complex GUI to do TDD. Uh, this is a, uh, some work that we just got accepted for presentation at the Agile 2006 conference this summer. So we'll talk about it a little bit, but more importantly, we're also going to do a demonstration and run through the exercise so you can see it. So that'll be what the April meeting is. And right now I'm leaning forward to May meeting, trying a, a technique called lightning talks. Anybody ever heard of lightning talks? Yep. So basically you get five minutes, you come up, no PowerPoints, you talk for five minutes, something that you've done, something you observed, an idea, something like that, and then five minutes later, another person comes yeah, up. You use the way. I don't think I can do that. You know about the way? No. At that same period, uh, we would have, you know, the daily standard meeting. And we would notice that at their times when they would just kind of go on, we would talk to them. And, and one of our guys, uh, Doug Joppy, had hurt his arm or something. He fell out of a tree coming. Something like this. And he had a, a five pound weight that he was setting set at his desk where he had to do this. And so we made it so that you could talk, but you had to hold the weight. <laughs> 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 you know, so you could talk as long as you wanted to, but you had to hold the weight. And so I might be able to take if the people are going over the five minutes, you can get it. You just got a lot of water. Lightning talks with our weights. Okay. Yeah. Thank Ron very much and Chad very much.